Patreon.com slash the walk off podcast. Uh, $4 a month gets you in there. If you're <laughs> watching this right now and you haven't hit the like button, Billy, get on it. Bug your brother. Tell him to do the same. I just read this message on Facebook and it was just this angry dude who felt we were being too positive on Sunday's long toss. I know you missed long toss. I don't think it was that positive of a show, by the way, but um, basically it was like, you guys are such idiots to put it in perspective. The Jays were 92 and seven or yeah, 92 and 72 last year. You think they act for them to do that this year, they need to play at a 600 level. You're probably not smart enough to figure that out, but that's six wins out of every 10. And I just wrote back. I'm like, you don't know what perspective is. Uh, Perspective (laughs) is May 23rd, 2022. The team was 22 and 20, also two games (laughs) above 500. That's perspective. (laughs) But anyways. Can you tell? I just want this team to win adam so that our lives are easier (laughs) uh yeah that would be nice um Uh, can i just preface this whole mailbag today by acknowledging the fact that personally i don't know if we received more criticism over this past week for being too down on this team or too delusionally positive and the com it's not like some videos where they people thought we were positive and some videos people thought we were too negative. It's the same yeah. video. Like, I don't know, I know. what people, people are want, pulling out. So I guess we're doing a good job sitting on the fence, but. I, I guess. <laughs> um, I do want to say something here, Adam, before we get into the comments. Um, Long time listener and buddy that actually came to a show of mine at Yuck Yucks in Halifax last I was out there, Christopher Keeping. So tip of the hat to Chris, Mr. Keeping out there. But his his boy, Bray, celebrated his ninth birthday hey, just birthday. yesterday. So a big happy birthday to Bray, uh, 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 grounds crew member himself and a follower Lovely. of the podcast. So a happy birthday to Bray. Lovely. Well, Bray, good luck uh, with your baseball career. Maybe we'll have you on the walk-off someday. That's right. Okay. Um, you can always reach out to us on Twitter at Walk Off Podcast. Send us a DM. Shoot us a tweet, whatever you want to do for uh, getting your message or comment on the mailbag. The Walk Off Podcast on Instagram. Obviously, we're always combing through Discord. You can shoot us a DM and we'll send you a link for that. Things are always happening in Discord. And then uh, tip of the hat to all the Patreon members. Of course, you get uh, priority, if you will. And we appreciate the support. So let's get into it. Okay. Um, I want to start with what I'm calling delusional comment of the week. Okay. Um. And that's just every comment we're going to get to. No. Um, (laughs) This one comes in from Andrew. Notable negative Nancy. I think daily filling our comment section with uh, whatever the opposite of toxic positivity is. Um, Andrew writes, I feel this is worth writing again. But if your offense is bottom 10 and your third, fourth and fifth starters have an ERA over five, you aren't going to make the playoffs. And on the one hand, I couldn't agree more. On the other hand, I'm not sure who he's talking about because that's not the Blue Jays. Mm -hmm. Uh, Starting pitchers, Alec Manoa has an ERA of 5.15. Everyone else? I mean, Jose Barrios is our next worst at 4.6. Kikuchi with a 408. You'll take that. Yeah. Uh, Chris Bassett, 303. Kevin Gossman, 314. So we don't have three yeah. starting pitchers with an ERA over five. Sorry, bud. Uh, it's just not the case. As far as offensive stats, uh, we're like top 10 in almost every category. The only yeah. category we're in the bottom 10 of is strikeouts, but that's one of those ones where that's a good thing. It's like golf. You want the lower score. So. Yeah. It is what it is a little bit. Um, and that has been the case, Adam, is that because it feels so desperate and because it feels so bad, 
Um, feelings never really translate when you start looking at the numbers. It's like when we brought up the, the how the home runs are down this year. And, and then you look at it and it's like, oh, and nope, then you look not. and you're like, how are they not down? They should be down. It feels down. How are yeah. they the same? <laughs> yeah. How do we only have one pitcher with an ERA over five? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Right. uh, It feels like the sky is falling um, for sure. Look, we got a lot of comments. I can't get to all of them, but a lot of comments along the lines of this is not a playoff team. Yeah. uh, Lifelong Jays fan, but I can't keep watching this team. Um, And to those people. Maybe it is worth taking a break. (laughs) Maybe it is. Look, we all enjoy sports the way we enjoy sports. It's a personal process. For me, I enjoy watching it passively in the background while I'm doing my work or while I'm making dinner or whatever. It's almost background noise. It's it's a very passive thing. There's 162 games. It's a grind, right? I get it. We're in the dog days of summer now. Here's the thing. For anybody that's feeling disheartened by this team, I mean, what's our record right now? 25 and 23? Mm -hmm. To to just mail it in as, well, this team's never going to go anywhere. There's no point even watching all this talent. We're underachieving. It is currently May 25th. No, May 23rd, 2023. Um, I want to go to... Because everybody loves when we complain about Shapiro and Atkins. We look to uh, the one true Lord and Savior, Alex Anthopoulos, and uh, what he's done with the Atlanta Braves. Well, the Braves, I think, is the perfect example for this. They won the World Series in 2021. So where were they on May 23rd, 2021? I'll tell you where they were. They were in the middle of uh, a four-game winning streak that still had them under 500. Mm -hmm. May 23rd, they were 23 and 24. They were two months away from losing Ronald Acuna Jr. for the season. On July 11th, they they announced season-ending knee injury. They were 44 Mm -hmm. and 45. They went on to, I think, think it was an 88-win team, I think, that season, went on to win the World Series. This is part of it. So just relax. If you need to take some time away, take some time away. Yeah. Also recognize that like the Rays feel like the best team in baseball. They're almost certainly not going to win the World Series. It's probably like it's just mathematically probably going to be someone else. Right now, it feels like there's about 16 teams that it could be. The Jays are. One of those teams. That's good enough for me in the third week of May. That's all I ever ask. I mean, I don't know how many years I spent growing up watching the Jays where this was not even season was over before it began. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get six months of games that mean something, whether or not it ends in a good result. I mean, again, statistically, you're going to win 3% of the time if you're lucky. So it's easy in these slumps to to forget that it's the pendulum swings the other way as well. And we are going to see this team win five to ten in a row one of these times. And and let me tell you right now, an eight game win streak erases a lot of bad juju. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that, yes, the timing of this skid is literally the freaking worst And if you don't think it's not affecting Adam and I, you are not listening closely enough. (laughs) Like, it's it's killing me here. Mm -hmm. Yes, to lose these games to the AL East is a dagger in the back, man. But to lose for – I just – and I keep coming back to this, that I've watched too much baseball to panic May 23rd. Like, I've been – a baseball nerd since I was like five, you know, 162 games. So much can happen. So much can happen. And if you are so frustrated and you're writing this team off and burn it to the ground, rebuild, fire shackins, all this, you can feel that way. It's part of this process. Totally. And honestly, and I might do it tonight. 
I've watched every single one of these freaking losses. I, I might just take a night off and maybe it's what's best for all of us mentally. Take care of your own mental well-being yeah. here. In the end, this is still just a freaking baseball team. All right. <laughs> no, very well said. Uh, this roster, again, is it underperforming at the moment? Are some spots weaker than others? Sure. But like we spent some time last week dissecting the Varsho Moreno Guriel trade. I don't ever want to revisit that trade again. Yeah. It's it's just depressing. Like it's like creeping your ex girlfriend's Facebook page and seeing what she's up to. It's just not healthy. Yeah. Right? We're not getting anything good out of it. Varsho's the guy no. we got. He's our girl. Let's ride with him. Yeah. You know, this is our team. Like, I mean, are there going to be tweaks that happen? Sure. We're going to add a bullpen piece here or there. This is our team. This is our lineup. Like, we're not making any. We did the big shakeup. We did the big shakeup in the offseason. That the same people that are furious right now were calling for. Anyways. Yes, exactly. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't get over the hump with a 92 win season. Need to do something. We did something. It was the wrong thing, apparently. I don't know. Uh I I predicted 93 wins for this team at the beginning of the season. And I still think they're going to hit it. I'm sorry. Yeah. I do think this is a 600 percentage baseball team. I do think they're going to win six out of every 10 games over the rest of the season or that it's going to average out that way. Uh, and you know what? If I'm wrong, listen, you guys are going to be thrilled. Those of you who are negative, right? You're going to be able to dance on my grave. It'll be wonderful come October. Um, why, why would you want to be happy about your team sucking just to dance on Scott's grave? That's the one thing I don't get. Like we're all <laughs> anyways. Uh, anyways, it is what it is. And Enjoy I'll be honest. I know we're, I, I know Adam, we're taking this more personally than it's actually meant. I'm well aware of that. You know, like it's just, we're so tied to, to this, to this team and this podcast that <laughs> like, I, I'm well aware there's, you know what? Like there's so many comments where I think if we were just talking in person, it wouldn't be quite as, uh, it wouldn't feel quite as, as feminist, you know, like it would just be like, okay. <laughs> and we'd talk and have our opinions and probably share a beer and it would be fine. You know, like taco time is one of my favorites. I actually, that's one thing about taco time. And it's funny because I didn't even know that he was a Calgary boy because which is ridiculous because now that I know taco time, like taco time is pretty specific to Alberta. Like he's really wearing it as a mm -hmm. as a badge of honor there, yeah. uh, you know, and, and taco tacos a really good baseball mind. And sometimes he's he's pretty down and he, he doesn't like the Atkins Shapiro regime, which is completely fine. I mean, I'm definitely uh, the the rope is getting shorter for me as well. Um, but. He even said, you know, like we were kind of arguing on the, on the comments or whatever. And then he's like, but also let me know your next show, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, you so go. there is a camaraderie amongst all of this. And, and we do love the grounds crew. And even though we're all pulling our hair out here and, and dealing with this brutal losing streak in different ways, come a win streak, you know, we're all going to be united again, right? It's just, it's rough times. Anyways, let's move on. Let's, let's get Thanks. going. Move on. Um, all right. So from James Doughty on Twitter, uh, DM Dustin said, Hey guys, Sunday's long toss. freaking awesome. Loved it. I know you guys were saying they should get into the trade market early, pay a little extra, but who are you after? Who would be some targets they could go after? What helps this team? So this is a great question, but also a very early in the season question to ask it's it's going to be really tough to pinpoint what is available right now i look i read a mlb.com article of okay early trade targets who's available which was mm -hmm. really handy uh i read it there was 10 names on that list unfortunately half of them chicago white Sox. yes i'm not even kidding yes no, I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. And I was kind of going over some stuff myself. L so let's start with this. If you're going to make an early trade, and when I say early, I mean about mid-June, you're probably going to need to target the bottom dwellers in the league. Because with expanded playoffs, obviously, there's just going to be more teams in it for longer. 
and they're going to take these organizations until probably at least the all-star break to decide what they want to do, whether they want to be sellers or buyers or, or stand pat, however this team or organization uh, feels the right path is. So some good guesses here as to teams that are going to be sellers. Colorado, who is awful. Colorado for sure. Maybe okay. we could go get Randall Gritchick. Ooh, fun, right? <laughs> I've got a better choice than Randall okay. Gritchick. Okay. Um, Cincinnati, probably Washington, and even the Nationals aren't that terrible this year. They're only, I think, six games under 500 and not even fallen that far out of the division they're in. Uh, Oakland for sure. Chicago, the White Sox, right? Kansas City, maybe Detroit. Even Detroit seems to be pulling out of it a little bit here. So it might be too early, mid-June for these teams to make decisions. But let's say there's those six teams, all right? Colorado, Cincinnati, Washington, Oakland, Chicago, Kansas City. Uh, the Jays' biggest needs, in my opinion, they need a bench piece for sure. Something more viable to go to in pinch hitting situations with a little bit more versatility defensively than Kevin Biggio. And I mean, Santiago Espinal was just put on the IL. So right now, the Blue Jays bench is Kevin Biggio, Otto Lopez, and Nathan Lucas. An upgrade there, I, uh, yes, please, you know. Uh, the other spot that they really could use some help is starting pitching depth. Bullpen, 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 and uh, a power bat would probably be nice. So let's start with the bench. What I would do is I would go knocking on Colorado's door uh, for Jerickson Profar. Okay, so he's currently on a one-year deal, $7.75 million. Switch hitter, something the Blue Jays do not have. He plays second base. He's got some shortstop experience, plays third, plays left field, and has some reps in right. Very versatile dude. He's got some decent speed on him. He's not a base stealer, but he runs the base as well. Uh, pinch hitting opportunities from both sides of the plate here. And he has a good bat to ball skills. Okay. He does make contact and he can lay down a bunt something right now. I don't know of anyone we can trust on the bench to do that. Okay. And he's, he's probably not going to cost a pile to Colorado, maybe the worst team in baseball and is going to be all for moving him before July. If Toronto is willing to take on that three to $4 million dollars, and they don't need to eat any of the money. And believe me, Jurickson Profar would be, he'd put our current bench to shame with the options that he's going to provide John Schneider and Don Mattingly later in games. Okay, and, I, and while you're knocking on Colorado's door, I would, I would check in on Daniel Bard from the bullpen there. He's got this year and next year left on his contract. Now he's a little expensive, nine and a half million a year. He is 38 years old, but he's doing really well. He's, his ERA is under one right now. And this is with Colorado, a very bad defensive team. Uh, well, you're in Colorado. Shit. <laughs> Check in on, on Charlie Blackman, right? He's 37. Mr. 400. Come, Mr. 400. He's, he's 37 come July. Uh, he's still putting the bat on the ball. He's got some power. Uh, he'd be a guy that, you know, maybe he could do something like uh, we've seen, like Rosario did with Atlanta, right? Uh, in 2021, where you're just like, he's not a profile prolific player, but give him a, a, a hot month and he can carry a team. <laughs> Hitting 276 right now, that'd be all right. Yeah. And he does have power. He's not putting up big power numbers this year, but he does have power. I mean, take him out of Colorado and who knows, but Charlie Blackman, definitely a veteran that could be had. He is a free agent at the end of the year. Okay, so let's go to starting pitching depth. And Adam, I do want to mention here, and I think everyone sometimes forgets about this. Hinjin Ryu is probably the cheapest starting pitching depth that this team can add. And it does give them the option to allocate some resources to other areas of need. Hinjin Ryu coming off Tommy John surgery last summer, and he's actually scheduled to throw a bullpen this week, buddy. He's hey, going to be on the mound what? throwing. Uh, the Jays yeah, say he's even, he's even slightly ahead of schedule. He should start throwing the live hitters in the next week or two and should be down in the minors doing rehab starts 
come June at some point. Wow. This is great news. That's great. This is really good news because we have talked about how thin this starting pitching depth is, and the Jays have been very lucky. And let's knock on all the wood. We've avoided all of the bad tacos out there. Very healthy team this year, but it is nice to have that guy who, if something happens, is there. And that could be Hinge and Ryu. And if that's the case, then maybe you could go out and get another starting pitcher like a a guy that came to mind is, is Zach Granke out of Kansas City, right? 39 years old. He's probably retiring at the end of the season. Would he want to go to a contender? And I know everyone listening right now just their buttholes got a little tighter when i said contender there Jeez, uh, a contender. I, yeah i i, I you know <laughs> he's got an era just under five but he's got a tidy little whip of 1.14 which goes to show you that this era under five that he has yes it is high but also i think having kansas city as the team that you're pitching for doesn't help as well um, I don't think he would make the playoff roster, but even just having a dude of Granky's ilk amongst some of these young starting pitchers, I think would be a good add. And he's going to be able to eat some innings moving up towards the playoffs. Now we go to the bullpen. This is where the real need is for the Blue Jays, in my opinion. And Adam mentioned it off the top of this of this comment which the Chicago White Sox go knocking on the Chicago White Sox store. Uh, Liam Hendricks is the guy to be had. And I say, bring him home. Of course, he was a starter for, for the Jays about seven, eight years ago. He has been dominant since moving to the bullpen, really carving out that niche for himself when he was in Oakland. He's a guy who's got a power arm, has big velo, can go two innings in high leverage situations. He has a year um, this year and next year remaining on his contract, 18 million a year, probably need to take on the 27 to 28 mil that will be remaining. And the Sox are going to want some legitimate talent back. A guy probably like Brandon Barriere's pedigree, uh, you can get a deal like this done without Tiedemann, I think. Mm -hmm. And if the Sox don't retain any of the money, my guess is it's probably going to be three prospects. One, maybe two of which need to be in the top 10 of the system. Heck, and if you're spending big with Chicago, I'd be I'd be checking in on bats while you're there too, right? Like, you know, Andrew Vaughn, I'd be checking in on. Tim Anderson's unhappy. Not that he's a real fit uh, defensively with the Jays, but, you know, Luis Robert isn't very content right now. Yeah, these type of trades are going to cost some real prospect capital if you're going to go out and get Liam Hendricks and a, a Tim Anderson. But maybe that's what this team needs. Those are kind of the ideas that I've had. Like uh, drop them in the comments, by the way. If you've got a, a target, a trade target, you think just fits this team really well, would love to hear about it. Um, as for hitters... This sorry. is the before there's no continue. Sorry. I'll, no, no, I'll no go ahead. My, no, I'll save mine for the end. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to get to hitters here. Hitters. I, I really do believe you're going to need to go after a guy on an expiring contract and you're probably going to need to wait for teams to figure out if they're buyers or sellers. Charlie Blackman, we mentioned, right. With Colorado, uh, Jock Peterson and Michael Conforto might be available from San Fran, depending on how they're doing. San Fran definitely struggled out of the gate here. Can they right the ship? Are they going to consider themselves buyers come the All Star break? I don't know. Uh, Josh Bell could be available out of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Same scenario with Cleveland. You don't know where they're going to be at come July 1st. Uh, again, we're going to need to wait and see, but. Those are kind of the dudes that I had my eye on that I think would fit well with the Jays. We'll see if they'll spend the prospect capital to really make a, a big augmentation. On a balance of probability, Scott, do you think that, I mean, Jays have to do something at the trade deadline, right? We have to make yeah. some moves. Yeah, even if, but, it's, even if it's just underwhelming like last year. But... Now, on a, on a balance of probability, do you think they do or should go early? Yes. Okay. 
Okay. My reasoning um, for that, Adam. My reasoning for that please. is it's going to be incredibly expensive at the trade deadline anyway. We mm-hmm. saw this last year with more teams competing for a playoff spot. There's just more need and more options for these sellers. So, of course, that that bolsters the price. Capitalism 101, right? So, mm-hmm. um, paying a little extra to get those extra wins and bolster this team mid-June, I think, is going to be worth it. Plus, you skip the queue and you don't need to compete with some of these other teams. You are going to need to pay a premium. That's the only yeah. downfall here. Yeah, no, I, I like it. Uh, we definitely missed out last trade deadline. I think that was a big part of the reason we had such a busy off season was to yeah, alleviate some of that stress. Uh, but yeah, I think go in early for sure. Um, okay, so what I wanted to get to was you mentioned Zach Granke. Um, this is an old report. This is from 2018. But Diamondbacks were shopping him to trade him and reports of hit what his no, tr- no trade team list was came out. Mm-hmm. 15 teams on this alleged no trade list. The Blue Jays are on it. So let's just rip that band-aid off right now. No. Again, asterisk, this was 2018. Yeah. Five years later, right? But some notable teams on here that I think when you really think about what kind of guy Zach Granke is, he's he's a weirdo, right? Like, a, yeah. A lot of his career moves have been. Insanity. Off there's the board, a, there's some really will. interesting, yes. I mean, mini documentaries on YouTube about the weirdo that is Zach Granke. Part of the reason I love him so much. Uh, go check it out, whatever. But here's the no trade list uh, for Zach Granke Orioles, Red Sox, Reds, Rockies, Tigers, Yankees, Athletics, Padres, Giants, Cardinals, Blue Jays, Angels, Dodgers. Twins and Phillies. If anybody can discern a pattern to this list, please let me know in the comments because I was waiting this, to hear the Rays. I was waiting to hear the Rays. Notably, on the one AL East team that's not on there. Um, I mean, this is where it's like, I don't know what the pattern is here. He seems to block yeah. contenders, but he's also blocking Oakland. So it's like he doesn't want to be in the Tigers. So he doesn't want to be on a contending team, but he also doesn't want to be on a terrible team anything in a big market (laughs) he's blocking Padres out Giants out Dodgers out Yankees out he likes playing in these small markets where he's like off the radar Mm -hmm. he's already got a World Series ring I'm pretty sure you get one with the Royals let me double check this before I go. Yeah, you'll have to look it up off the top of my head. I And it's funny because I know I've looked this up about Granky myself before. Sorry, this is great listening right now. I know. Um, doesn't look like he did win a World Series. Nope. Anyways, I could I- fact check that, I'm sure, and find the details on it. So... Go ahead, light me up in the comment section uh, for not being good at pulling this off the top of my head. Point being, Zach Granke clearly is like a guy who's just happy to like be an awesome pitcher and get paid and yeah. doesn't want to be like the face of a franchise or whatever. So I don't know. I don't know if he would be. Now that said, Adam, in a Blue Jays uniform, but who knows though, at 39 years old, on the verge of retirement, if that changes a little. And if he doesn't have that ring, and I don't think he does actually, maybe that is something that he wouldn't mind checking off his bucket list. So maybe maybe he is available to contenders, but that list you read is very interesting. (laughs) I I do like seeing the Yankees and Red Sox and Orioles on that list. Wish I had seen Mm -hmm. the the Rays as well, but it is what it is. Okay. Um, Anything else to add on this topic before we move on? Let's move on. Okay, uh, Wyatt messaged me in the Patreon and said, Hey, Adam, would you send me a link to Discord when you get a chance, please? Uh, so, yes, Wyatt, I have done that. Check your inbox. Uh, also, why the fuck is Kevin Piggio still on this roster? Scott, care to handle that question from Wyatt? I don't know, Wyatt. <laughs> I really don't know. Um... 
I truly am at the point where I do think the bench is going to need to be addressed come the trade deadline. I don't think that a playoff team goes in with a bench of Nathan Lucas and Kevin Biggio and whoever else is on the bench. Um, yes, a healthy Santiago Espinal does make the bench a little bit more appealing. However, it is not pretty. So I think that, again, not to not that Jerks and Profar is the be-all and end-all, but somebody of that ilk who could come in and provide some actual value off the bench would be nice because currently Kevin Biggio is a black hole of offense. He's not the stalwart defensively that makes up for the lack of production at the plate. He's no Andrelton Simmons, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I texted you and Joel this on uh, Friday. So the numbers need to be tweaked by a couple at bats here and there, but you get the gist from what I'm getting at here. Okay. So I ran the numbers and looking at a timetable of the last three seasons. So 2021, 2022 and 2023 batting average across those three seasons. Bo Bichette would need to go hitless for his next 620 at-bats, which would take him roughly 143 straight games. So 143 drought, 143 game hitting drought is what he would need to do to have a batting average across those three seasons below 200. Kevin Biggio needs to go over 12 in his next 12 at-bats to accomplish that same feat. Yeah. The last time he was good was 2020. 2018. Well, no, 2020, 2020 right? COVID season that we dismissed. Yeah. We, you know, wholesale right off as like, well, you know, whenever we look back at a player and we say, well, he was bad this year, but that year didn't count because it was COVID. It was a 60 game stretch in 2020. He showed potential and has done nothing since. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a Cavan apologist and I have run out of rope. To give the guy, but the front office still seems to like him. I don't know what it is. Would you be su- would you be more surprised if he's still on this team after the trade deadline, or more surprised if he's gone? Okay, I'd be more surprised if he was gone. However, if after the trade deadline, he's not in triple A, I don't know what the hell this organization's doing. Okay. So he's not gone probably because he has no trade value. He has no trade value. That's, that's, that's my opinion anyways. Now that said, maybe, maybe he's an add on, you know, like maybe they're like, we need Brandon Barriera. We need Semro Burse and throw in Kevin Biggio. And if the Jays were like, no, we don't want to do Kevin Biggio, they'd be like, okay, give us any bottom 50 prospect. Yeah. I'm probably being too negative on on Kevin right now. I just, I'm so sick of seeing that that man come up to bat and just not deliver. (laughs) Would, Would he benefit? Would he find rejuvenation if he was an every time player? Yeah, I, I I honestly believe you knew Kevin where I was Biggio, going with that. Yeah, Kevin Biggio going to the Oakland Athletics would probably be the best thing for him. Kevin Biggio in a in a Kansas City Royals jersey probably rejuvenates his career. You know, I I really think at this point Biggio could just use a change in scenery, which happens all the time with players, especially guys who have been pigeonholed as a utility guy and have the fan base constantly breathing down his neck like i i'm sure it's not comfortable for him i'm sure he gets a ton like i mean my goodness the amount of hate mail we get and we're just two bozos in our spare rooms like cabin biggio is probably getting death threats which is completely unacceptable you know like he's just i'm sure he's feeling the heat i'm sure it's not a lot of fun and so maybe going to cincinnati is what the guy needs well here's a silver lining spin on this you you touched on how hard it's how the change of scenery could potentially do him good. How hard it is to get out of that slump 
when you're the target of such vitriol from the fans and it's hard to avoid the Twitter and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. So slight pivot, but I think a genuine tip of the cap is in order for what Nate Pearson has been able to do. Can we acknowledge that, that like, yeah, he was in a very difficult spot as well. We spent most of the Mm -hmm. off season going, this guy is an absolute bust, right? All the hype that was around him, total trash. He's never going to help this team win. He's a and very competent bullpen arm for us at this he, point. He he's truly going has two been innings. Adam. He's throwing some leverage innings. Like I don't know, just a because we spent off season roundtables pondering: Does he just need to be traded? Like maybe mm-hmm. we can't ever get anything out of Nate Pearson, but maybe if you know, there's still. 100 miles an hour, that has trade value, right? And maybe he can get it going in uh, Chicago or, you know, some Mm -hmm. other system, right? Just a fresh start or he's not the burnt out prospect. He's just a guy and can go make make something for himself. So the fact that he was able to get back to the MLB level and be competent here, I think that's honestly major tip of the cap to Nate Pearson. I, I agree 100%, and I'm glad that you brought this up. And honestly, on top of all the outside peripheral noise that he's constantly had to deal with, rehabbing is one of the most difficult things an athlete can go through. And the fact that he's gone through two years in a row of that yeah. had to have been incredibly mentally draining on the kid. And to see him on the mound and succeeding and in a major league uniform day in and day out, what a what a success story you know like what a nice what a nice positive beam of light that is in this very dark time for us blue chains fans so yeah tip of the hat to nate pierce and i think he's only going to get better the more he plays at the mlb level and doesn't blow up just and gets more confident like that's ugh. I'm I'm high on on Nate Pearson again. His off speed stuff has been good too. That's one thing that has impressed me is it's not just he's out there throwing 101. He is pitching, and good on him. Uh, okay, thanks for the question uh, from the Patreon Wyatt. Uh, and yeah, check your inbox for a link to the uh, the Discord server. Okay, speaking of Discord, we're gonna pivot to the Discord server now. Scott uh, Veracity, you had hey. some. You want to start with this one from Veracity? Yeah, sure. His opinions on Ross Atkins. Do you have it in front of you or no? Uh, yeah. I sorry, you sent me this I... one. I can read it. I'll just read it. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, sorry. I just didn't That's have right. it in front of me. It's all good. Uh, so Ferocity in the Discord had said that uh, I have an opinion that Ross Atkins is a middling GM. Not a good one. He waits too long to strike and then has little option, little to no options left. He gets played by the market. We have seen this happen with Encarnacion, Morales, Donaldson, Flaherty, Strowman, Simeon Woods, Richardson, and now this. Okay, so it's an opinion that may be correct. And I I do respect the veracity in this comment doesn't say Atkins is shit, he's garbage. He says he's a middling GM which is probably the scenario that is the worst case scenario for Blue Jays fans is that because Ross Atkins probably can get another job, even if he winds up getting fired. It is tough to build a team that goes out and wins 91 games and then 92 games. And it's still, I know, I know there's a lot of negativity on this team currently, but they really are on pace with last year's team. And we have watched Blue Jays baseball long enough to know that maybe more than most organizations, this freaking team makes us sweat it out until August and then they really turn it on. The dream is that happens again. Okay. Okay. So this isn't an uncompetitive team, but championships is what everyone is after. So if that's the case, then maybe he is a middling GM. If this doesn't work out this year, I think that his rope is up. Now, some of the examples he gave. Sorry, can you clarify that? If it doesn't work out this year, as in if they don't win a World Series, he's out? Is it se- World I, Series make, or bust no, for Ross no, Atkins? No, no, no. No, no, no. I think if they, if they, if they go to the ALCS, he's fine. 
he's probably fine if they go to the division series in all honesty. Um, in my opinion though, if they miss the playoffs, get them the hell out of here. Right. Like if, if they don't, if they don't even make a wild card, I'm, I, I my rope is done, but yeah, irrelevant playoffs are where best we're, for sure. Yeah. Like uh, irrelevant of where we're all at with our rope with Ross Atkins, let's get back to the question uh, or the comment, which so number one, the incarnation Morales thing is still probably, in my opinion, I know everyone with Dalton Bar show is going to lose their mind with this. Th- that was probably his biggest mistake to date. I, I really think that 2017, they probably still wouldn't have been a playoff team, but Edwin sure would have done a lot to make that a more competitive team. They really missed his bat and Kendris Morales just didn't pan out in any sense of the word. And the worst part was, is that the Jays could have brought EE back. They just didn't give him enough time to, to kick around free agency. And I think that was a really big learning experience for Ross Atkins. And I think he is approached free agency differently with guys within the organization going to free agency in the open market. And I think that has benefited the team long run, long term. I mean, everybody makes mistakes and I'm not apologizing for that mistake. Honestly, the Edwin mistake is still one of the ones that just sticks in my craw the most. Uh, As for the Donaldson Flaherty one, I mean, honestly, that is so hindsight. You know, like this team was, they were really still trying to field a competitive team in 2017. And don't forget, going into 2017, they had gone to -to back-to-back American League Championship Series. Why would you strip that team down? Yeah, you lost Edwin, but you you feel like you're looking at the numbers and you're like, maybe Morales can can do what he did when he was in Kansas City and, and just be a straight across even Steven. Losing Edwin, gaining Morales, it didn't work out that way. And then there were some pitching injuries. Um, yeah, shoot, I'm trying one. to think of his name. The guy with the the, who, the soft tossing. He starts with an E, and his back was all sore. They got him out of Milwaukee for Sean Markham. Um, oh my God, dude. It's going to come to me. Everyone is already yelling at the the audio right now that they know what it is. But anyways, great change up. None of this is, is helping, eh? No, I'm Googling as fast as I can here. Okay. Uh... Either way, Jack Flaherty, it came out, was available for Josh Donaldson. But in that in that off season, and so you can say he waited too long, but there is a lot of hindsight in that one. As for the Strowman, uh, Simeon Woods Richardson trade, I mean, technically, it's who got who we got Jose Barrios for. If you want to really do the math on that, I don't know if Jose Barrios is worth Strowman. I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, look. It's just one of these things. I could go down anybody's resume of missed fires on the trade market, and Alex Anthopoulos has some too. So, I don't know. I just hate this game of, let's pick the anecdotal evidence that proves he's a bum. Because for every terrible trade Marco he's Marco Estrada, sorry. Estrada. To yes, interrupt you. Got you. There. you got there. <laughs> no, but my point, my point remains... For every bad trade he's made, he's made good ones as well. So it's, mm-hmm. I don't know. Which is what a middling GM does. Well, good trade, bad trades. No, yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, lo- I don't know, this roster. How much? If Alec Manoa doesn't regress, if he's a Cy Young, if he's a front runner for a Cy Young right now, Mm-hmm. How much does that change everything? I mean, the team definitely has three or four more wins. That's for sure. Three or four more wins. I think the bullpen is fresher. I'm not. Look, I'm not. I I already feel like I'm. I'm putting all of this on Alec Wendell, and I don't Which mean it to. Is not the case. Is not the case for sure. But 
this time last season, everyone loved Alec Manoa. This season, mm-hmm. not so much. I mean, there are just... If Vladdy was on 50 home run pace, like, these aren't Ross Atkins' fault that we have a bunch of superstar potential guys who are, like, playing really well instead of effing fantastic. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is that John Schneider's fault, maybe? I don't know. Maybe he's not getting the most out of his guys. I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, I, I team slump. I just think this is a brutal slump that we're going to look back on in 2024 during the brutal slump they go through in 2024 and talk about this. I don't know, man. Like it is what it is. Okay. Speaking of slumps and you can answer this quickly and then we'll move on. We do have two more comments to get to here for the, the rest of the mailbag, but Matt Chapman started the season as a world beater may mm-hmm. eh, not so good to say the least mm-hmm. how does this impact or does it his free agency market do you think yeah do you, do you think teams look at him at what he did in in april i mean again we have four months to go but if this continues right if it's half the season three months are he's hitting 350 and half of the season he's hitting 150 do you think in my opinion, Adam, because if, we're talking like mega deal for him yeah. in April. Go ahead. It might. I mean, it might be the best thing for the Jays if he just returns to his career average. Right. I don't know, buddy. Uh, listen, Matt Chapman is for sure going to get. Triple digits. He's going to break a hundred million dollars and he's probably going to get five years and he is probably the best third baseman on the market. All of these things play to his advantage. Of course, he's struggling right now. Nobody expected Matt Chapman to hit 450 for the season. I mean, like, let's be serious. He was hitting 400 for like almost all of April Mm -hmm. and he even started to slump at the end of April. So, you know, like he, he hit 500 for three weeks. It's insanity. It's insanity what he did. And we're starting to see him come out of it. I know he got a couple of hits last night. We saw Whit Merrifield get a couple of hits last night. You know, there is signs of life within this team. Last night's game, like I turned it off in the seventh and a lot of it had to do with just bonehead plays. Like again, this attention to detail mantra has just, it, 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 it's such a glaring obvious problem right now and it's they're overthinking things there's guy like everyone watching knows this team is reeling right they're losing their minds we're losing our minds like think about that clubhouse man you know they know how good they can be and that they are making this more and more difficult for themselves every time that they make a mistake every time they give an out away every time they they overthrow a base every time they get caught stealing frick Whit Merrifield getting picked off at first the other day drove me nuts Whit Merrifield running yesterday from second to third with one out on a little dribbler by Danny Jansen that just li- the ball literally rolled to the third baseman and he just had to tag him like just bonehead plays are costing this team runs and when you're losing games to the race six four and you can literally see where those two runs came from it's frustrating. I'm talking in circles now, but. Okay. I'm going to give you two paths and I just want you to tell me which one you personally would prefer as a Jays fan. Option number one, Matt Chapman has a, has an April like, I'm not saying 400, but he has yeah. a incredible offensive remaining four months to the season, right? Hitting 300-ish, showing pop the rest of the way, which then inevitably leads to a, let's call it Marcus Simeon type deal. Seven years, Mm -hmm. $175 It prices the Blue Jays out of the market. Whatever number you want to make up, that's irrelevant, right? But he has the kind of second half to the season, that prices where the, the Jays, Jays are no out, longer in it. Where we go, all right, we can't compete because we love you, but the Dodgers are just in, throwing insane money at you and we can't do it. So that's option one. 
phenomenal second half to the season. Or option two, it's kind of this. It's a good option month one. and a bad month, good month and a bad month. So he's less helpful to the Blue Jays this season. Uh, option one. Option one, yeah. You? I think option two. I think I prefer the really? option Really? Where... Yeah. Yeah. I think in general, uh, in general, my philosophy is I want the the biggest window of contention that I can have. And I think that's what option two leads to because I am really scared of a 2024 Blue Jays team that doesn't have a third baseman. Yeah. Doesn't have a third baseman, doesn't have a second baseman, doesn't have a center fielder. I mean, Dalton Marshall will slide into center okay, field, then, no problem. He doesn't there. have a left fielder, whatever. I just mean there's a, so much question marks moving no. forward. I don't like the idea of this team next year, but we're replacing Kiermeyer, Merrifield, and Chapman with uh, Arelvis Martinez, Addison Barger, and, and Jerks and Profar. And jerks and Profar. <laughs> yeah, that's. That doesn't feel like a, a path that I care to go down. So now, if it makes you feel better, Adam, Matt Chapman is option two. In my opinion, that is what he is. Yeah. He is a very, very good third baseman with the glove. He's a dude who's going to hit twenty-five to thirty home runs, and he's going to have some hot streaks, have some some down times. I think his numbers are going to look better this year than last year, but time will tell. He's going to be expensive either way, but definitely uh, five years over a hundred million is definitely easier to swallow than 175 over seven. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, still big money for a second baseman in Marcus Simeon. Okay, uh, two more to get to, and we're out of here. So first one comes in from Barry Fox on YouTube. It says, question, this is a long one. Follow me here, Scott. Que- question, and he answers his own question, provides a solution, and then a follow-up question. So, question. With Danny Jansen seemingly getting a tune out of Manoa today, so his last start on the mound, do you start Jansen four out of every five times through the rotation? Answer, no, due to load management. Solution, start him four out of every five games, but switch him with Kirk when they go to the bullpen every time. Any merit to this? Would love to hear your thoughts. So is- It's interesting. I haven't, I haven't seen anybody in baseball doing a uh, catcher platoon quite in this manner. Mid-game. It's an interesting mid-game. It's an interesting thought. Um, I think what would hold them back from that is that Kirky would probably already be in the DH spot. Yeah, uh, that's a possibility. That's uh, a unless point. unless Belt is there, which is fine. Uh, I do think that they like to give their catchers a full day off unless they're going to use them in a pinch hitting situation. So I I don't see this as a as a viable option. It's an interesting way of solving a problem, um, and I think Kirk is really coming around defensively. We watched him throw some guys out over the last couple two, you know, after uh, over the last couple games that he wasn't doing earlier in the season. So he's coming back into form. Everyone seems to forget too that Kirk took some major time off in the spring because his wife was having his child. And then he came in to spring training about halfway through and was eased in slowly and was just behind the eight ball for most of April. And now we're starting to see him come together. His bat's getting better. His time behind the plate, he looks better as as just a defensive catcher. And this is one of the things, and I I mean, incremental increases in places like defense are easy to dismiss, but he's doing it. And I know a lot of people's whole, oh, if only we had Moreno, then this team would be 10 games above 500. Uh, is because he's been such an animal with his arm. I mean, Moreno has an absolute rocket behind the plate and has been throwing out base stealers. But if Kirky can do the same thing, or at least close, you know, that's huge. We already know what Kirk can do with the bat. So 
I think Kirk is completely fine behind the plate. I think this two to three games each, this even split we're kind of seeing is going to continue, and I'm I'm kind of all right with it. Here's another downside to doing mid-game splits. If the reason that you're doing Jano four to five times is because you're saying, well, he calls a better game or whatever, right? If you're just saying for whatever reason, Jansen is the preferred option behind the plate, but we can't just run him out there 150 games this season. He'll break down whatever, right? That's the premise that we're operating under. I don't think the solution of going to Kirk in the bullpen when the game is a higher leverage situation makes sense to me. Right? Like in in my opinion, that's when you want more than ever to be calling, you know, it's a three two game in the eighth inning. If the whole reason of having Danny Jansen out there four out of five times a week is because he's calling a better game or he's getting the most out of the pitchers, then that's the guy I want in the eighth and ninth inning. You know what I mean? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess unless the alternative is you go to Kirk in the bullpen when it's a blowout, but I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thought. It's, I don't know. Thanks for the question, Barry. That was a fun little mental exercise, if nothing else. Yeah. Okay, last one here. Fun one to end on. Uh, Marcus loves watches. Um, So we asked Mark Shapiro what the value of Shohei Otani was. Is he, as some people like to throw the number out, he's worth a billion dollars a year. Right. And I kind of threw to an organization. I kind of threw Joel under the bus by attaching his name to this comment. I just really wanted to know. This is something that Joel has mentioned off the cuff. Look, of course, he's not worth a billion. It was just it felt good to get a a proper person in the industry to uh, to acknowledge that. So Marcus says, $1 billion, what is this? Joel's fan fiction screenplay for Austin Powers 4? So great, <laughs> great comment. Made me laugh. But the real question here, Scott, is uh, Marcus says, I would love to be so on board. Sorry. I would be so on board with Rogers giving Otani 11 years, $605 million, even if it meant potentially not having money to sign either Bo or Vlad at the end of 2025. Am I crazy? So give all of Bo's and all of Vlad's money to Shohei Otani instead. Is he crazy? I mean, I really don't know how to answer that question. I would love Shohei Otani for the next 11 years. Even the fact that he's 29 and this takes him well into territory where he obviously won't be half the player he is right now. If the Blue Jays had a little bit better minor league system currently, I might be into this, you know, like there's nobody really position player wise knocking at the door to take over third base or first base or shortstop or, you know, so I don't know. So if we made that trade this deadline, let's say we traded for him with the intent to sign him and then we signed the extension or whatever. Trade and sign situation. We get Shohei Otani and Bo and Vlad for two and a half seasons. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. But I also would because that Otani bat in this lineup would be freaking unbelievable. Yeah. Um, counter to that is if I'm Bo Bichette, I am, and the Blue Jays make that trade. I, as fast as I can, demand a trade as well. I say, get me off of this team. Like, if you guys... Really? Oh, yeah. I'm saying, if you guys... The way he... Yeah. The whole, like, animosity between him and the front office, I don't know if there's any truth to that or not, but that's a very clear sign. We are not giving you money. That's a... You don't value my services? I'm fucking out of here. Like, no, I'm I'm not trying to trade me. Trade me away to I a team disagree. that values me 
and that will give me what they think I'm worth. Not I'm we the, rarely the disagree. Guy. Yeah, we rarely disagree. This is a good one to end on. No, that if I'm both of them, I'd be like, I'm out of here. I'm walking. No. Are you, what? If they bring in Shohei Otani and I'm Boba Shed and Vlad, I'm doing high fives. I'm like, amazing. Now we're a real contending team. We're going to be one of the top teams in all of baseball. If they win a World Series, do you know how much those two are worth? in free agency it's just going to increase their value mm-hmm. they both want to go to free agency anyways as sons of ex-major leaguers i don't think they give a shit about how much they feel valued i mean boba is... i don't i don't think a world series ring increases their their value on the open market i think it only it freddie freeman it, i don't think freddie freeman is already a superstar i don't think his contract goes up or down depending on whether or not the Braves won the world series. I think that's only a factor for like old vets, like Brandon belt, old, old guys, young guys are getting a mega payday, whether they have it or not. Cause I think it's a crap shoot, whether you get one or not. Yeah. But how much better are his numbers going? Are their numbers going to be with another bat like Otani in the lineup? Like think about the Bichette depth. Is a career like- 300 hitter. What else can he do? You think his numbers go up to 350 for the, like the next three years? I'm just saying like to, I don't know, maybe you're right, but I just don't think that these guys have that mentality. I think that they want to win and who wouldn't want Shohei Otani on their team. If they want to win, they would take less money to win. They want money and they want to feel appreciated. You can want both Adam. Like it's not one or the other. If that was the you case, you can want to be well paid and you can also want to win 100%. Then why is it such a big deal that the Blue Jays bought out Bo's Arbiers and were like, look, here, here's a little peace offering of, you know, we value you. We don't want to keep going through this. Here's some security for you, blah, blah, blah. And look how good he's playing. Like that, every it's time we talk deal. to anyone on it's on a big deal because look at his numbers. He's smarter right than now. us. What? It's a big deal because look at his numbers right now. Like he has yeah, been incredible he got paid this and season. And he's happy. That's the thing. Yes. That's what I mean. Because he's feeling respected and valued. There's no Exactly. There's no way to take a oh, I could be in line for 300 million, let's just say, with this organization. I can't wait to get there one day. To all of a sudden, there that same organization being like, "You know what? Nah." We got a different guy in mind and we're going to give him double the money that you wanted. There's no way to not take that as a slap in the face. We don't know what's going on behind closed doors. In my opinion, I text it's Bo very every likely every day. Scott. It's very likely that Bo Bichette has already Never told answers. them we're going to free agency. Like they probably, if they're going to make such a huge move as to going out and getting Shohei Otani and giving him all of Bo and Vlad's money, there's no doubt in my mind that they've already talked to Bo and Vlad and we're told, ah, we are super rich guys with super rich dads. And we're probably going to go to free agency no matter what you say or do. And if you want to be the top bidder in free agency, fine. Otherwise, we're just going to play it out. Maybe. I I don't think there is. Honestly, dude, I just don't think there's any way there's a player on this team that wouldn't be anything but absolutely over the moon if Rodgers went out and spent on Shohei Otani. But... What a ridiculous little argument this is. Something that will never, <laughs> ever, ever happen. <laughs> uh, all right. We'll see. Uh, that's mailbag. 